Hi, welcome to my audiobook. So let's start with chapter 30 of Schwartz Principles of Surgery 11th edition and the title is The Appendix. You will see this on page 1331 up to 1340. Are you ready? Let's start. The Appendix. History. Although anastomosis such as Vesalius and Leonardo da Vinci had written about the appendix, Claudius Ammiand in the early 18th century was the first surgeon to describe a successful appendectomy. In subsequent centuries, significant progress was made in the diagnosis and management of appendicitis, especially after Chester McBurney advocated for early appendectomy in his 1889 publication. Famously, the magician Harry Houdini died of a ruptured appendix after suffering a blow to his abdomen. Following the introduction and widespread of use of antibiotics in 1940s, the mortality rates improved further. In 1982, Kurt Sem, a gynecologist, reported on the first laparoscopic appendectomy, which is now the most widely adopted technique. Embryology, Anatomy, and Histology Previously considered a vestigial organ, the appendix is now linked to the development and preservation of gut-associated lymphoid tissue or gout and to the maintenance of intestinal flora. It has been suggested that appendectomy is associated with increased Clostridium difficile infections and increased subsequent cancer such as colon and esophageal. As a result of microbial alteration, although this is currently unproven, the protective effect of an early appendectomy against development of ulcerative colitis has been proposed to mechanistically link to the release of dimeric forms of IgA from plasma B cells and the Th2 response mediated by IL13 producing natural killer cells. The appendix along with the ileum and the colon, develops from the mid-gut and first appear at 8 weeks of gestation. As the gut rotates medially, the cecum becomes fixed in the right lower quadrant, this determining the final position of the appendix. The appendix is a true diverticulum of the cecum as it contains all the histological layers of the colon, although certain differences in the irregularity of the crypts remain. The average appendix measures 6 to 9 centimeters and derives its blood supply from the appendicular branch of the iliocolic artery. Visceral innervation occurs along the superior mesenteric plexus, which is T10 to L1, and the vagus nerves. The appendix is intraperitoneal and retrocecal in location, but it can be pelvic in 30% and retroperitoneal in 7%. Grossly, the appendicial base can be identified by tracing the convergence of the cecal tenia. That's it for embryology, anatomy, and histology. Next is acute appendicitis. Inflammation of the appendix is a significant public health problem with a lifetime incidence of 8.6% in men and 6.7% in women, with the highest incidence occurring in the second and third decade of life. While the rate of appendectomy in developed countries has decreased over the last several decades, it remains one of the most frequent emergent abdominal operations. The etiology of appendicitis is perhaps due to luminal obstruction that occurs as a result of lymphoid hyperplasia in the pediatric populations. In adults, it may be due to fecalites, fibrosis, foreign bodies such as food, parasites, calculi, or neoplasia. Early obstruction leads to bacterial overgrowth of aerobic organisms in the early period and subsequently it leads to mixed flora. Obstruction generally leads to increased intraluminal pressure and referred visceral pain to the periumbilical region. It is postulated that this leads to impaired venous drainage, 
mucosal ischemia, leading to bacterial, tran bacterial translocation and subsequent gangrene and intraperitoneal infection. Escherichia coli and Bacteroides fragilis are the most common aerobic and anaerobic bacteria isolated in perforated appendicitis. For the key points, number one key point, inflammation of the appendix is a significant public health problem in lifetime incidence of 8.6 in men and 6.7% in women with the highest incidence in the second and third decade of life. While the rate of appendectomy in developed countries has decreased over the last several decades, it remains as one of the most frequent emergent abdominal operations. Okay, let's go back to the acute appendicitis. This sequence is not inevitable. However, some episodes of acute appendicitis may resolve spontaneously. Due to the differences in epidemiology, non-perforated and perforated appendicitis are considered different diseases. Additionally, since not all non-perforated appendicitis progresses to perforations, it is suggested that the pathogenesis of the two condition it is suggested that the pathogenesis of the two conditions may be different. So that's it for acute appendicitis. Next is clinical diagnosis. History. It is important to elicit an accurate history from the patient and or family in the case of pediatric patients. Inflammation of the visceral peritoneum usually progresses to the parietal peritoneum, presenting with migratory pain, which is a classic sign of appendicitis. Inflammation can often result in anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and fever. Regional inflammation can also present with an ileus, diarrhea, small bowel obstruction, and hematuria. Pertinent negative history including menstrual must be obtained to rule out other etiologies of abdominal pain. For the physical examination, most patients lay quite still due to the due to parietal peritonitis. Patients are generally warm to touch with a low-grade fever approximately 38 degrees Celsius or 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit and demonstrate focal tenderness with guarding. McBurney's point, which is found one-third of the distance between the anterior, anterior superior iliac spine and umbilicus is often the point of maximal tenderness in a patient with an anatomically normal appendix. Certain physical signs with their respective eponyms can be helpful in discerning the location of the appendix. Rob Singh's sign. Pain in the right lower quadrant after release of gentle pressure on left lower quadrant. Dunn fist sign. Pain with coughing, suggests retrocecal appendix. Obturator sign, pain with internal rotation of the hip. Pelvic appendix. Iliosoas sign, pain with the flexion of the hip. Retrocecal appendix. In addition, pain with rectal or cervical examinations is also suggestive of pelvic appendicitis. Laboratory findings. Patients with appendicitis usually have leukocytosis of 10,000 cells per cubic millimeter with a higher leukocytosis associated with gangrenous and perforated appendicitis, approximately 17,000 cells per cubic millimeter. C-reactive protein, bilirubin, IL-6 and procalcitonin have all been suggested to help in the diagnosis of appendicitis, specifically that a white blood cell count and a CRP are two appropriate lab tests to obtain in the initial workup of appendicitis. A pregnancy test is also essential in women of childbearing age. Lastly, Urinalysis can be valuable in ruling out nephrolithiasis or pyelonephritis.
pyelonephritis. So that's it for the first part of this appendix chapter. You can proceed to the second video, to the part 2 for the continuation. Thank you!